following up with what we talked about with electron configuration. And there are a few rules that we want to think about that help to govern what those electrons are doing. And those are going to be known as Pauli's exclusion principle. Well, our first day of notes, we learned about rules for quantum numbers. I know you guys are still foggy on those, and it's okay because tomorrow we put that into application. We're going to assign quantum numbers to things. But what Qu Pauli's exclusion principle says is that it's not possible for all four of those quantum numbers to be the same for any two electrons within an atom. In other words, each orbital can hold two electrons, but they would have to have opposite spins in order for that to be the case. So that's what Pauli's exclusion principle tells us. Aufbau principle, that's what we talked about yesterday. It was electron configuration. And we said that in order for these electrons to fill up the energy levels of an atom, they're going to have to go from the lowest energy level to the highest energy level. They, they go in order of low to high. And it's not possible to fill up a set of orbitals before filling up a lower set of energy level orbitals. And Aufbau is just German for um, building up. And then finally, what we're going to talk about in the first part of today's notes when we do orbital diagrams, also known as spin diagrams, we're going to talk about Hund's rule. And it basically says that the electrons enter orbitals of equal energy one at a time before then coming back and pairing up. And they do this to minimize repulsion that uh, could take place. So first thing we get to is our orbital or spin diagrams. You should know the term spin diagram also, just in case you ever see that. And when we do this, it just shows how those electrons are going to be placed in those individual orbitals. And we're going to represent those orbitals with boxes. Occasionally, you'll see those orbitals represented with dashes, like what we see right here in our example. I prefer to use boxes because I can't easily um, differentiate the space between my dashes the way I can with my boxes. So you'll see that as we go through these examples. But in order to do this, we have to think about Hund's rule. And we just said it means that those electrons enter into those orbitals one at a time before coming back and pairing up. What I want you to think about is a school bus. This is the school bus rule. That when you guys board a school bus, everybody jumps on the bus and says, woohoo, here's my own seat. And everybody spreads out. And as more and more people come onto that school bus, that's when you say, uh-oh, I guess I have to scoot over and let somebody else pair up, let them sit with me in the seat as well. So it's the same sort of thing that these electrons are going to go to their own individual orbital first before coming back and pairing up with them. And the way they're going to pair up, it's going to be an opposite spin. We are going to represent spins with arrows. And by tradition, it is the, the convention is to go ahead and do an up arrow first and then a down arrow. So that's just a, a rule that's used. So for example, the, the example that's done for us here, electron configuration for sodium. What we're going to see, and this is probably listed for us somewhere in our notes, is that, oh, it's listed right here. I, I saw it. Um, we are doing this noble gas. There we go. We are going to think about electron configuration, and we're going to do the shortcut method, where we have our noble gas, our most recent noble gas, is going to be listed in brackets for us. And we're just going to show the orbitals since that most recent noble gas. So in this example, when we're showing sodium, you look and you see that your most recent noble gas is helium. After helium, it's going to be a 2s2, 2p6, and then a 3s1. That's everything. Actually, you're right, you're right, you're right. That would be better. OK, the answer, the, the comment was that really even, this is just an example we have listed here, but a better way to do this would really even be to say that we've got neon. And then after neon is a 3s1. So for the 3s1, actually, you don't need to draw that one there. But for the 3s orbital, you would just have one orbital, and we're showing one electron, one arrow, and it goes in the up direction. You have that example drawn out for you. Let's go ahead and um, do some other examples. I'm going to pass on talking about this right now. But um, let's look at, we have our first one is going to be nitrogen. So with nitrogen, what is our most recent noble gas? Helium. Helium. So 
it is going to be, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw, see if I can fit this in pretty well. You might have to do yours out, out to the side unless you write really small. But I'm going to do my electron configuration underneath, and then I'm going to draw my orbitals, my boxes on top of that configuration. So I know it's going to be helium, and then it's 2s2, 2p3. Hopefully everybody's feeling comfortable with that now after yesterday. So from this, how many orbitals are there in an s? Two. Orbitals. Four. One. Two electrons, but one orbital. How many orbitals are there for a p sublevel? Three. So I'm going to draw my boxes. There's one for my s. And I make it all attached. There are three for my p. So this is why I prefer boxes, because otherwise it's hard to tell when there's a big space between something and when there's not. But now what we want to do is we want to think about how those electrons fill those orbitals. Well, the first couple electrons that come along, they go into the 2, the second energy level, and it's in an S. So there's one of those. Remember, each of these orbitals, each of these boxes can hold two electrons. There's the other one. It's an up-down. I have now filled the S sublevel, so I can move on to the P. So think of this whole P thing as being one big school bus. So all of those electrons are going to go to individual seats first before coming back and pairing up. And how many are we looking at? We're looking at three electrons. So it's going to be up, up, up. You'll notice I make little half arrows just because it's easier, so that's a great way to do it. If you want to make an entire full arrow shape, you're welcome to. Um, so if it was a 2P4, and we'll see some examples. In fact, let's just wait on that until the next one, until we get to oxygen. Yeah. One orbital? because S's only have one orbital. So what you're going to see is that when you do these, your S, P, D, and F, as far as the number of boxes, you're going to have one, three, five, and seven, because that's your number of orbitals that you've got for each of these. So the next one we look at is oxygen. And with oxygen, it's just right next to nitrogen, the one we just did. So it's just going to be one additional electron. We're going to have helium. And then after helium, we know it's going to be 2s2 and 2p4. So in this case, we've still got our one orbital for our s, and we've got three orbitals for the p. You know what? Before I move on to this, let's look at something like carbon, which is before nitrogen. Just find it on your periodic table. Even though carbon would only be up, up, right, there's only two in the P, you still have to draw that third box. So you still have to represent all of the orbitals within a sublevel, even if they're not used. I just want to throw that out there because I've seen people make, um, have some misconceptions on that. Okay, so with oxygen, we've got a 2s2, so both of those electrons go into our uh, s shape that's in the second energy level. And then as far as the P sublevel, we've got four electrons in that second energy level. So it's going to be up, up, up. Uh-oh, looks like we have to share a seat. So you go back to the very beginning, down. So it's always going to be in that order. Okay, I'm going to keep whipping through these because there might be some we want to spend more time on. Yes? Because if we look back, there's a couple ways we can think about this. We can think about quantum numbers, or we can think about, um, the question was, why are there three for the P? So we've talked about orbitals. Remember, when we looked at shapes, for example, we said the P has, it's double lobed there on the X, the Y, and the Z. Those are the, the three orbitals. So we learn that, that P just has three orbitals. It's one of those things we learned. We learned it when we talked about quantum numbers as well. We can also look at our periodic table and kind of see that, right? If you've got two electrons per orbital, then you can have six electrons fit into that, that P shape, that P sublevel. 
So we see that on our periodic table as well. So there's a couple of different ways that you can come up with that information, and it's really not just pure memorization. Okay, so then we move into manganese. And for manganese, that is number uh, 25 on your periodic table. So what's your most recent noble gas? Argon. Argon. I didn't leave myself room. Okay, so we've got argon. And after argon, it's going to be, say it again, 4s2, right? 4s2. And then what? 3d5. So we remember that we have to subtract 1 from our d. So you subtract 1 for your, from your d, 2 from your f, if you ever come across that. How many boxes should I draw for my 4s? 1. How many should I draw for my 3d? 5. So now it's time for those arrows, which are representing our electrons. We've got two electrons in our 4s, so they're happy as can be, according to Pauli's. They can't be spinning in the same direction. They're going in opposite directions. We do the up arrow first, then the down arrow. Now we've got five electrons to deal with in our 3d. Up, 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 up. Because it, the reason it's 3D is because you have to subtract 1. Remember, you'll never get any valence electrons that come from a D sublevel. So for your D block, look back at your notes from yesterday. We wrote that down on the periodic table. We said in that D block, we subtract 1. In the F block, we subtract 2. Okay, so that's with electron configuration. And we're going to keep going through that. We'll, you'll, you'll see that reinforced today. Okay, so we've got our five um, electrons that are in that, that 3D right there. And last one that we'll look at, GD, which is number 64. So everybody find number 64. And in this case, what's your most recent noble gas? Let's see. Xenon. And then after that, what's it going to be? 6s2, then what? 4f8. 4F8. Good. 6s2, 4f8. So when we draw our boxes, we're going to draw one for the s. How many for our f? Seven. So we have just shown all and we know, need to show those spin diagrams of those electrons with the spin, the uh, arrows. So the two that are in the 6s, up, down, and we have eight that are in our f, our 4f. So it's going to go up, 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 down. Okay, so we've got those eight electrons that are in the 4F, and that's it. That's all there is for spin diagrams or orbital diagrams. Um, I think that's really all we need to mention there. Here's something, you know, I'm going to show this real quickly. I think I'm going to pause the video, though. Um, okay, so now everybody's feeling comfortable with electron configuration and orbital spin diagrams. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do some electron configuration for ions, remembering that an ion is any atom that has a charge. So um, as we read through this, it just says that elements gain or lose electrons to form ions. They, they carry a net charge to them. So if they lose electrons, they're going to have more protons than electrons, so therefore have a positive charge. If they gain electrons, they'll have more negatives, therefore having a negative charge. So that is spelled out for us in here somewhere, and we want to underline a couple terms, cation and anion. So again, if they lose, if an atom loses electrons, it has a positive charge associated with it, so it's considered a cation. If I had room in my notes, I would probably over in the margin, I will just do it right here somewhere. I would make myself a note that a cation has a positive charge, so there's my plus, 
And then an anion, I am just going to underline the N for negative. So an anion has a negative charge. That's something you guys do need to have kind of pretty solid in your brain there. Um, now, when we go through and do this electron configuration, we need to think about something known as the octet rule. So see if you can fill this in somewhere also. The octet rule, that says octet, it doesn't look like it, but that's what it says. The octet rule is just like it sounds, octet means what? Eight. 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 So our rule is that our atoms are most stable, and we talk about them in terms of being happy, but it's really that they're most stable with full outer shells or energy levels. So that should help us explain why those noble gases, we saw yesterday that they have eight valence electrons for the most part, and they don't want to bond with anybody else. They don't want to gain or lose electrons. Which one noble gas doesn't have eight electrons? Eight valence electrons? Helium. But is it happy? Does it want eight or is it happy? It's happy. Why is it happy? Okay, so two electrons is the maximum that that first energy level can hold, and that's what it's got. It's ecstatic. It's ecstatic? <laughs> yes. Okay, we're back. Um, so now we're going to do electron configuration for ions, and that's the big difference here. We notice that these are ions because we see things like this, negative 1 plus 2. That tells us what's going on with those electrons. So the first thing I want to do is just do the electron configuration for the stable, the neutral atom. So if we were to write it out, and we're not doing shortcuts on this, we're just going to write out the long method for fluorine, which we all see is number nine. So I'm going to let you guys tell me what is the electron configuration. One, S, two. Two, S, two. Two, 2p5. Two okay, so that's where we stop. That would be fluorine. So we can tell we, we didn't practice these much last night, which was epicosity night, but you can, you're going to get into the, the rhythm of that and be able to just spit these out. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Well, that's really not that stable. So instead, what happens is it forms an ion. Fluorine happens to be a really reactive non-metal. It can very easily gain these electrons, which we see it's doing right here. It gained an electron, therefore getting a negative one charge. So when it, gets, when it gains an electron, this is no longer a five. What does it become? It's a six. It's a six. <laughs> so we have one S2, two S2, two P6. So it becomes, really what's happening is it becomes stable by adding one electron. So real soon, looks like it looks exactly like neon, and we're going to mention that here in just a second. Um, so eventually, you guys are going to be able to say, hey, what would be the most common charge that would be formed by something like fluorine? And you could look at that and say, well, it really wants to gain an electron so that it could be just like neon, because that's every atom's goal in life is to be just like a noble gas. So um, that's what we see there. Let's go ahead and do strontium. Strontium has a plus two charge. We're going to do just the neutral atom of strontium first. Let's think about this for one second. Our one second is over. Okay, everybody ready? Go. One S2. Two S2. Two S2. Two S2. And then. Three. Yes. Yeah. 10, 4, P6, and then what energy level? 5S2. Okay, so there we go. There's our neutral atom of strontium. So there's our neutral atom of strontium. What do we want to do? What, 
in order to be like a noble gas, to have a full outer energy level, I look and I see that right here, this is our highest energy level, right? What, how many valence electrons do we have? Two. Two. What do you think the easiest thing to do would be to gain five, or what else could it do? Lose two. In fact, that's what we see happens. So we know right away what to do with this, because we're told it has a plus two charge, meaning that it lost two electrons. And can you see where those two electrons are? The outer energy level electrons, those go away. Those get knocked off. And by losing two, and um, basically it becomes most stable by losing two electrons is what we end up seeing here. So as Maddie was commenting on, we notice that these things look like noble gases, and there's going to be a word that we want to use here. I'm not sure that this word is in your notes, but you're going to write it down. And the word being isoelectronic. So they have the same electron configuration as a noble gas. That's what isoelectronic means. It's same electron configuration. So the fluoride ion, F minus 1, is isoelectronic with? Neon. And the strontium ion becomes isoelectronic with? Nope. Krypton. Krypton. So same number of electrons. If I were to add up all of these electrons in the fluoride ion, we would see it would be just like neon, and there would be 10 of them. For strontium ion, if I added up all of those, I would see it would be just like krypton, which is 36 of them. So that's what we know about um, our ions. OK, now, yeah, go ahead. No, um, I did that in per the purpose of illustrating what to do. You don't need to do this. I just did this to show you guys what's going on. So if you were to write the electron configuration, you could just write 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's the electron configuration for F minus 1. You don't have to do it the way I did it. I was just doing that for the teaching purpose. Okay, so yesterday we filled in on our chart um, our, our periodic tables, on the top we wrote down the valence electrons for each of those groups. And we saw that for the main group elements, or representative groups, it was just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But when we did the electron configuration, we saw, for example, I think we did vanadium, we might have done zinc, a couple others. We saw that it was always going to be what, what was our valence electrons. You guys remember? Think about it. Two. It would have to be a plus two. Or, or I'm sorry, a, a two for your valence electrons because you've got the S2 and then it dropped down to the D to a lower number. So what we see is that transition metals, the valence electrons, the ones that are involved in reactions, um, they uh, we still have to think about those. And the valence electrons are lost the ones that are lost are not in the highest energy level. So if we want to write the electron configuration for something like um, iron plus 2, I'm going to write it up in here where I've got space, we're going to see that iron, everybody find iron, is number 26. And tell me, without the charge, just tell me the electron configuration for iron. Ready? 1s2. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3p6. Good. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4. Um, S2, then 3D, and we count over, and there are six of them. So that is for neutral iron. However, if it has a plus 2 charge, then what we end up seeing is that those valence electrons, where do you think they come from? What energy level? The 4, the 4S2. So these guys go away. 
So that's what it ends up looking like. So if you wanted to write this in shorthand, you could say it's going to be argon, and then it's going to be a 3D6. So that's what it ends up looking like. Okay, and now we get to, um, actually, I'm going to come back to this. Again, this is just isoelectronic. If we have time, we can come back and play around with that. Last one I think I'm going to do on this videotape, and then I'll do a separate videotape for the, the next parts of this. But um, let's do look at the difference between diamagnetic and paramagnetic. And an element is considered diamagnetic if there are no unpaired electrons. And what this means, if it's diamagnetic, it opposes a magnetic field. So there are no unpaired electrons, and you've got this written here to where you can find it and maybe underline it. Um, and it does produce a magnetic field if it's considered paramagnetic, and in paramagnetic, it has unpaired electrons. So that's something that you just kind of have to get set in your, your memory. So when going through these, we want to think in terms, what do you think would be helpful to draw to be able to figure out if those electrons are paired or not? The arrows. The arrows. So we want to be able to draw those orbital spin diagrams. So let's do our shortcut method on this. For magnesium, my most recent noble gas is going to be neon. And then after neon is going to be a 3s what? 3s2. I'm going to write that down below. So there's my 3s2, if I want to write that too. I'm going to draw one box. And in that one box, what are my arrows doing? Up and down. There we go. So then we could do the same thing. Um, actually, I guess we should answer a question about this. Is this going to be diamagnetic or paramagnetic? Do we have any unpaired electrons? No. No, you don't. So what is that? If there's no unpaired electrons, then it is diamagnetic. That's all you have to do on these, but it does take a little bit of remembering the terminology. OK, so then with argon, no, I said argon. That would be our noble gas that we're going to be looking at. We're doing this for iron, iron, so it's going to be argon, and then after argon, what do we write? 4s2, and then 3d6, 5. Did we say 6 last time? I don't remember. It is 6. Is it six? One, two, three, four, five, six. It is six. Okay. Good. I just can't count. Um, so for our boxes, we're going to draw one for our S and five for our D. And in this case, we've got up, down. And then for our iron here, in the 3D, it's going to be up, 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 up. Up, down. Look at all those unpaired, um, unpaired electrons are just jumping out at you. So you know that this is going to be classified as Para paramagnetic. Okay, good. And then let's just. Yeah, so what this means is that if it's paramagnetic, it's able to produce a magnetic field. And I don't know that we hold you guys responsible for that, but that's what that means. And if it's um, diamagnetic, then it opposes a magnetic field. Okay, finally, um, we've got a last couple here, which we've got cadmium and phosphorus. So for cadmium, our most recent noble gas is krypton. And then we have, after that, is what? 5s2 and 10 of them. 4d10. So we've got one box here, we've got five boxes here, and when we draw our arrows, we see that it is up, down, up, 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 down, 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 down. So this would be classified as dia. Last one we see is going to be, um, if it's phosphorus, we're going to look at neon. After neon, what do we do? Okay, good. 
3p3. So we've got one box, three boxes. Boxes represent orbitals, remember. And then we come back and we do our arrows. Up, down, up, up, up. Lots of unpaired electrons. Sounds to me like it would be paramagnetic. Okay, I think there's going to be a separate video for um, colored metal ion solutions, Lewis dots, and exceptions to electron config.